specifically uh, to to look at. I mean, most of us use these records to understand Al Qaeda and how Al Qaeda look upon us, right? Uh, I've used these records uh, in a, with a different perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm using them to. Uh, to see the Taliban through the eyes of Al-Qaeda. Uh, and the significance of that is that Al-Qaeda, you know, it, it, we look upon it as an international terrorist network and all, but it was, you know, in the context of Afghanistan, Al-Qaeda was one of the actors that were dealing directly with the Taliban leadership and were directly affected by their political decisions. So that documentation is an extremely important source that can help us understand the Taliban, uh, and that's what I've been doing uh, in this paper. Um, so what do the captured records tell us? Uh, well, first of all, uh, and you, those of you who are familiar with these documents, uh, you know that they say a lot about Al-Qaeda's military contributions to the Taliban. You know, many of the records deal with, uh, or they are, uh, they comprise reports from the front lines from the commander of the Hadi, uh, an Al-Qaeda commander uh, outside of Kabul, who was commanding the Arabs uh, who were fighting for the Taliban. And uh, writing reports about their achievements, sending it back, back to Abu Hafs, uh, uh, Al-Qaeda's military leader uh, in Kandahar. And uh, these reports reveal, you know, um, things that have been, it has already been argued, but it sort of reinforces that argument that in fact the Arabs were not important to the Taliban. Uh, the Arabs were a small group. Uh, they had some military skills, but they were not really vital to uh, the Taliban's war effort against the Northern Alliance. And that of course raises questions as to okay, uh, you know, at least questions the hypothesis that the Taliban hosted Al-Qaeda because they were dependent on Al-Qaeda's fighters and financial contributions and all that, you know, it questions that. Uh, the documents also reveal that Al-Qaeda, from their side, they had two reasons to be at the Taliban's front lines. Uh, one reason was, uh, I mean, was naturally to help the Taliban and to get goodwill from the Taliban, reinforcing their sanctuary. But another and equally important reason uh, was to train their own cadre, to train their own people, um, to give them battle, uh, battlefield experience, and in order to use them in their global project. This was a very important reason for why Al-Qaeda contributed to Taliban forces. But the topic I'd like to discuss <clears throat> in more detail now is uh, uh, not about Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, their military uh, relationship, um, but it's a paradox in the history of Al-Qaeda-Taliban relations that uh, is not well known, but it has, it, I mean, it comes to light through this documentation. Uh, and I'll discuss that paradox and then uh, give an uh, interpretation of it uh, based on my own studies. So the captured records, they confirm that from around 1999, the Taliban regime uh, sought to impose a stricter control on the foreign fighters in Afghanistan especially uh, the Arab militants that these documents talk about. They did this through issuing ID cards, for example, to foreigners. They did it through closing down several militant training camps. Uh, we know that, you know, at the time uh, when the Taliban closed down a training camp, uh, from a U.S. perspective, or in the West, we sort of didn't really believe it. You know, we thought it was just a show uh, in order to please, in order to ease the pressure, uh, the massive pressure from the you know international community to close the camps. But in reality, which was observed as well, they you know they 
maybe they closed down one camp, but they opened another camp, or they opened the same camp uh, shortly afterwards. So we didn't really take this process seriously. What the documents reveal is that the Taliban had different reasons to close down these camps. You know, there was a logic to it that I'll explain uh, shortly. <coughs> Uh, but first of all, what happened uh, was that uh, you know training camps were closed down. Uh, foreign militants had to register when they entered the country. Uh, the Taliban left a few camps open, and one of them, and the most important one, was the Al Faruq camp uh, in Kandahar, that was run uh, by Bin Laden uh, and Al Qaeda. So why did the Taliban do this? You know, it's very tempting now to draw the conclusion that by doing this, uh, the Taliban empowered Al-Qaeda and Bin Laden. Because obviously, this is what Al-Qaeda wanted. Al-Qaeda wanted to control the influx of foreign recruits coming to Afghanistan. Because they wanted to uh, be able to have this pool of recruits and select the best ones to, to work for, you know. Uh, to recruit them into Al-Qaeda and to uh, take part in the global agenda. And the Taliban allowed this to happen. And uh, generally, we, you know, we explain this by saying, uh, yeah, because Bin Laden was able to influence Mullah Umar, he had great power in Afghanistan, he was, you know, he was a personal friend of Mullah Umar, that's why he managed uh, to work his way into you know the 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 inner decision making of the Taliban and influence their decisions. Uh, I believe this is not true uh, because there are other sources also that's been uh, that's been published in recent years saying that you know Bin Laden didn't really have any influence over the Taliban's decision making. You know, he was not married to Mullah Omar's daughter. He was not, there was no family relation. He did not go fishing with him, you know? Uh, and these things that, that were rumored. I mean, Afghanistan was full of rumors. And there were rumors about, uh, for example, Bin Laden and Mullah Omar being very close friends. But looking at the sources, uh, this is not true. So then how do we explain that Taliban wanted to <coughs> give this power to Al-Qaeda? I believe that <coughs> Taliban's actions need to be interpreted in light of the domestic and regional context. And this is what I'm uh, doing in this study. And I'll, uh, I'll just uh, continue just explaining this one example with closing down the camps, why the Taliban did that and uh, afterwards argue that that can be also you know, transferred to other questions, like why did the Taliban not expel Bin Laden? Well, that was um, also because, I believe, because of domestic pressures to, to keep it in, in Afghanistan. But uh, back to the closing down of the camps. Um, it's very important to understand that the Arab in uh, the Arab community in Afghanistan was very diverse. Al-Qaeda was only one group out of many groups. And there was a lot of differences between them. And there was a lot of conflicts and at times also infighting between the various Arab militants. A crucial part of this conflict, it was not about Bin Laden's global agenda, you know, although there were Arabs that were criticizing Bin Laden for wanting to attack the United States. But that's that's one thing. Much more important from the Taliban's point of view was that there was a battle going on or a discussion among the Arabs, a very tense, a very, uh, very tense discussion going on about whether uh, it's legal to fight for the Taliban or not, whether Taliban's fight against the Northern Alliance is a true jihad. You know, this was very important for the volunteers who came to Afghanistan and who were encouraged to fight on the Taliban's fronts. Because there were elements in Afghanistan among the Arabs that were trying to convince them that if you do that, you go to hell, you know, because they're not doing a real jihad and they're not a real government. Um, this was of direct concern to the Taliban uh, because it challenged their legitimacy as a state. 
And more importantly, uh, it was a security issue. The Taliban were afraid of spies that would infiltrate the state. Uh, there was an assassination attempt uh, against Mullah Umar in 1999. And these environments, these radical uh, takfiri environments, they were uh, a perfect environment to plant spies by Iran, by other foreign governments. The Taliban thought. So they, want, so they needed to get these guys under control. And that's why they used Bin Laden for that purpose. That's, that's my hypothesis. Um, because Bin Laden was supporting the Taliban. Bin Laden was encouraging people to fight for the Taliban. And besides that, he was, he was a famous person because he'd been participating in the, in the war against the Soviet Union. He was a charismatic leader. He was a guy that could curb the differences in the environment. I think that's why the Taliban decided to give the camp, uh, you know, the camp to Al Qaeda, the camp that uh, received new volunteers. So, and I talk more about that in my thesis. Um, but for now, um, I suppose the conclusion um, is that uh, I believe it's important to, you know, uh, when we interpret the relationship between a global militants and a local group supporting them, it's important to not to have, it's important to have an open mind and to remember that this group is, you know, it's operating in a local context. And it's the local context more than the international context that's deciding their policies. And if we manage to understand that, you know, then we could also understand what it would take for them to abandon the foreign fighters. And that's something that <coughs> will continue. I mean, it is a debate today and it will continue uh, as long as Al Qaeda. Uh, is finding sanctuaries. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Very interesting and a good segue, uh, in particular with respect to Bin Laden and his role uh, to Dr. Lynch's paper. Dr. Lynch, over to you. Great. Thank you, Juan. Uh, thank you to all my fellow panelists, and let me offer a, a personal thanks here, uh, not only to my colleagues at uh, CRRC for hosting this panel, but also for Johns Hopkins University and the Army Center of Military History uh, for, for their strong and crucial role in hosting this very topical and, uh, and very, I think, important uh, amongst the many dozens of uh, other important uh, commemoratives that have gone on around this town and around the country in the last year. And I do think this is an opportune time. Whether we you know, do our counting from the tragic date of 9-11 or maybe we, we start looking seriously at the interactive engagement of Al Qaeda that uh, although it began prior um, to October of 2011, really only began in earnest in Kandahar in a date that will come um, as an anniversary date in several weeks here on October 7th when we finally sent uh, a U.S. Uh, human uh, effort uh, in there with our Rangers. And then the date of October 19th, which is the date recorded for the 5th Special Forces as their first insert south of Mazari Sharif to participate with the Northern Alliance. And it's in that context I want to, want to discuss uh, my major thesis here today, which is uh, the 80% solution, the death of bin Laden, Al-Qaeda, and South Asian security. Because it was th at those moments, much more so than our uh, uh, attempted uh, cruise missile strike against bin Laden after the uh, Africa bombings of 1998, or our efforts of uh, diplomatic engagement with the Taliban uh, to try to dislodge bin Laden in the late 1990s, where we really engaged in what has become uh, a, a war, a war that's not looked like wars we got used to in the 20th century, but a war. Uh, and it's that war and that, that war in context of South Asia that I think it's important uh, to discuss today uh, from a frame of reference uh, of outside in. And the outside in is what we kind of know about Al Qaeda, what we've kind of known but forgotten about some of the complexities of the relationships between those interacting in the jihadi movement in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and South Asia. Uh, and then also, what we have perhaps never known, but need to rediscover pretty quickly if we're not going to have more difficult challenges going forward about the dynamics of South Asia security and how 
basically in 2001 in the effort to eliminate this metastasized and serious, if not existential, terrorist threat, uh, we became a player in a local conflict that indeed is a regional conflict with elements of a civil war in Afghanistan uh, superimposed and impressed upon by a proxy war between now two nuclear armed states, Pakistan and Afghanistan. And so it's in that frame of reference I wanted to discuss kind of the outlines of the paper uh, I'm due to publish next month, which talks about Bin Laden's death on the important dimensions, the global dimensions of Al Qaeda, which I will argue to you here in a second, we've known for a long time. Okay, we just we we, we massage on the margins uh, and, and we want to hedge our bets, but we've known for a long time. Second, the implications of that death for the things that matter most in the context of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, and then the things that matter in South Asia that we need to understand more, need to do more research on, and I'll argue needs to be one of those veins of analysis and research that Brian highlighted, and I think Anne has extended here, about how the workings between Al-Qaeda and Salafi jihadists, and in particular, the government institutions in Pakistan, have mattered and will continue to matter going forward, and what that means for us, I think, in terms of policy uh, debates for Afghanistan and Pakistan policy. So, with, with that as a setup, let me just uh, me take off and pop those three clusters. Indeed, my premise here is that with the death of Bin Laden in May of 2011, the United States and Western governments scored a major but still underappreciated victory in this decade old, this decade and a half war against Al Qaeda that became truly interactive 10 years ago. Bin Laden's death, as many of our panelists have said here, did not eliminate all the features of Al Qaeda that make it dangerous and a factor of terrorism internationally. And I think there's a growing consensus around that point, but perhaps a tepid uh, reluctance to explore the regional and local implications of that, which is where I want to take us right now. And, and therefore, Al-Qaeda's role in assisting local jihadi terror groups in strikes against domestic governments and in efforts to either inspire or claim the inspiration for inspiring, inspiring lone wolf terrorism and would-be martyrs and tragic acts of violence will certainly remain with us for many years to come. Indeed, I'm going to describe that here as the 20% residual of what Al-Qaeda has represented and tried to manage over the last uh, 15 to 23 years of its existence, depending upon when you start tracking it, either from the Shah in 1998 or from the Fatwas and the Edicts of uh, 1998. Uh, yet I want to argue here that the manner in which U.S. intelligence and military operatives found and eliminated bin Laden in Abbottabad, by Pakistan was devastating. Indeed, an 80% solution to three of the five most critical elements of Al Qaeda. Those elements are its core efforts to energize truly catastrophic terrorism against the West. Second, its branding rights as the ultimate victor, should any of its loosely affiliated Salafi Jihadi regional movements ever achieve success in a local insurgency, especially the one in Afghanistan. And third, its ability to claim victory, much less reestablish a credible and unfettered training area for global jihad, <coughs> in the area that's most critical to its own mystique and lore, Afghanistan and Western Pakistan. Now, I'm going to offer that those three are subtexts and sub-elements of kind of what are the five major categories that I would argue to you uh, based upon not only my research experience here over the last uh, 14 months, but also my time as kind of a policy conduit uh, working in uniform my last six years, either for U.S. ambassadors or four stars in charge of commands trying to filter in a lot of what you all and now I produce in terms of policy relevance of what we're looking at. And in that context, I, I harken back to 2004 working in CENTCOM and, and, and noting that, you know, back at that time, a report published by the Century Foundation with a lot of luminaries uh, who really understood jihadi terrorism in the late 1990s called Defeating the Jihad as a Blueprint for Action kind of got basically right what Al-Qaeda was about. And in their framing and their reference, I think they accurately defined Al-Qaeda as having a kind of a embedded bullseye effect on a wider set of, of Islamic, but not Islamist, issues and identifications. Indeed, the wider sphere being, uh, you know, the 1.2 billion Muslims worldwide, a vast majority of which are concerned for their own future, their children's future, and are struggling and continue to struggle with what modernity means and what progress means and how the West either influences positively or negatively that but aren't inclined towards radicalism or violence against their own governments or nationally or internationally. A internal core of Salafi jihadi movements that, as we've discussed here now, and I think quite enlightened, because I, I hearken back to 2004 when working for CENTCOM, 
And my boss named General Abizade and a guy named Doug Lute, who was the operations officer, uh, you know, and, and a couple of the rest of us would travel to places in Saudi Arabia and UAE, and even uttering the phrase Salafi or Jihadi was met with absolute approbation and a reluctance to discuss. And there was a parallel reluctance to discuss that here uh, in uh, Western societies that continued onward uh, you know, all the right way through the next 40 years. And indeed, I made a shout out here to a couple of the people who've spoken uh, as panelists and whose uh, you know, works in 1998, the terrorist projects perspectives, Mark Stout and Jessica Huckabee, I thought were path-breaking in terms of a willingness to call out what, in fact, this wider set of movements was, which was Salafi Jihadi. Uh, not all Salafis are Jihadi, but the Salafi Jihadi brand, which was conspicuously oriented around the fact that violence, and only violence, indeed radical change could be the only change, was indeed the, 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 the breadth or the internal hub of what uh, Al-Qaeda was geared to, one, exploit, and then two, to help try to facilitate into this wider vision of far enemy versus near enemy. So in that context, I would offer to you that we've known for a long time kind of you know, what the center elements are of Al-Qaeda. Indeed, it's this core that's tried to personally brand and carry out global terrorism of a spectacular nature. It's particularly geared to try to uh, shock and appall the West and drive it out of Muslim lands, where, of course, the thesis that I, th I think still, as Brian indicates, although there's some tweaks that Zawahirbi may be making here recently, uh, you know, either intentionally or perhaps uh, you know, with an ulterior agenda, is that meaningful change can't come other than by violence. And indeed, this is a trait, I would argue to you, as this work did, uh, and as Mark Stout and his co-authors did uh, back in 2008, and then Mark and I wrote about in 2009 in a piece published out of here, is, is a particular trait of radical ideologies. Indeed, the history of ideologies and radical ideologies, there's this trait that you can have groups like communists talk about change through the ballot box or talk about it through social revolutions. But the real characteristic of a radical core metastasized group is that it is inherently and unalterably wedded to violence. And here I think the core of Al-Qaeda is in fact wedded to that. Indeed, expanding that circle, Salafi jihadi groups at localized levels to include the Algerians, which we discussed back in the early 19. Uh, 90s, uh, as well as all the other local branding groups are also wedded to the notion that violence against governments is what matters and what is critical. It's that wider pool in which they swim that I think is where we need to be more critical in thinking about Al-Qaeda and what the, uh, the end of uh, bin Laden means and indeed what ultimately the end of Zawahiri would mean as well for the movement. Because radical ideological movements that have a core and that have a vanguard aspiration to knit together the other similarly based uh, agendas uh, from regional levels, or that look to inspire what we now call lone wolves or individuals to acts of violence and then claim credit for them, uh, tend to be very charismatically oriented. And here my argument is, and it's not unique, I mean it's been made for a long time, uh, but I want to endorse it here as part of the thesis I'll advance, is that Bin Laden was unique in bringing together these elements, these three kind of organizing elements. And Zawahiri brought not only kind of the what was later published as the Knights Under the Prophet's Banner uh, overarching uh, ideology to this thesis. Indeed, there were others before him that did a much better job of this. But he brought together the organizational zeal and the capability of a hardcore network of Egyptians and Libyans that once fused with, seriously, in Afghanistan and Pakistan, uh, Bin Laden's financial and kind of ethereal, mystical qualities put together Al-Qaeda in the pernicious form we've known it since uh, 1998. Uh, the question then is, after the death of bin Laden, does that form still exist, or is it likely to exist moving forward? And here my argument is, we need to understand the form kind of refined. The three elements are critical. I've already addressed those, but let me just review them quickly. First, the core element, which is to train and try to do the activity involved in spectacular catastrophic global terrorism. And as been discussed throughout this conference, and as is in my paper, there have been no conspicuous successes of this element of Al-Qaeda since 7-7-2005. Okay. There have been lots of plots and plans, but there have been no successes. Now, a lot of that goes to better defenses and better offensive networking and work, but it also goes to the fact that just how hard it is to find vanguard guys of the level of uh, those that we have captured or taken off the battlefield to really plan, plot, and work successfully, especially in an environment where wider intelligence networks and wider persistent unblinking surveillance is present. Secondly, a slightly larger notion of a vanguard or somewhat wider network of affiliated Sunni Salafi groups 
But here, I think the panel has also brought out a critical element, which is Al Qaeda is parasitic, right? It desires to ag agglomerate successes at local levels, and indeed has fought battles verbally and others with some of these local groups about what the priority should be, how priority should be met. Indeed, if you go back and study the Algerian insurrection, you will see the now infamous and recently deceased Ayatollah al-Rahman as a failed effort to go and try to corral violence in Algeria and indeed try to co-opt an Algerian uh, 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 revolution, conspicuous in its own nature, nature uh, to the proto-Al-Qaeda, the Al-Qaeda before the 96 or 98 Fakwas and before EIJ was brought in as the first effort. But I guess kind of goes to the point here that if you sit back and disaggregate from the personalities of bin Laden particularly, but also Zawahiri, you have guys like Rahman and others who in the 1990s couldn't fuse this stuff together. What makes us believe that going forward from now, absent these particular personalities, we're going to see that ability going forward? And then finally, this notion of inspiration for a broader terrorist network. I mean, this can be claimed by many others. And as Brian, I think, has correctly pointed out, there are many rich research questions here about just how much that inspiration means to those who would conduct terror attacks. Or, a more critical question, just how, in the policy arena, just how relevant that is compared to other lone wolves who may be energized by other causes and be equally violent. And of course, we now have the sad example of Anders Breivik in Norway to remind us of our own Timmy McVeigh in showing us that compared to those types of actions and activities, is $53 billion of a homeland security structure primarily geared towards Al Qaeda spectacular strike or the potential underwear bomber in an airplane or uh, aircraft carrying uh, UPS uh, uh, based printer cartridges? Is that relevant and equal in importance to some of these other uh, tasks and foci that we may want to look at? But with those three elements, the core, the vanguard, the inspiration, I think there are two others that I need to discuss before moving on to implications of bin Laden's death, the three areas. And that is a fourth element that's occurred and accrued from Al Qaeda, especially since 9 11, is its branding element. Indeed, this kind of notion that it above all else matters and is the most relevant to the wider Salafi jihadi construct, which again is a minority construct in Sunni Islam. And we need to keep that in mind, I think, all the time as we discuss this. But also, you know, what was what what led to this lore? And I think here, testimony by a guy who I always watch carefully for what he says, Stephen Call, because of his background and expertise in this area, he testified in front of the House in early 2010 that this, this brand name element of Al Qaeda really oriented around a couple of things. First, the spectacular success of 9 11, which is fast faded in terms of mythology and lore over time. And indeed, also faded as that. In the, in the Muslim world got supplanted by the, the images of carnage and devastation inspired by Zalqawi in, in Iraq, which Al Qaeda tried to claim credit for in other places. But second, the ability of bin Laden, particularly in Zawahiri, also to remain folk heroes because they survived for so many years outside the ability of Westerners to take them down. Indeed, that, in, in my personal experience of living in Qatar and Saudi Arabia and spending a lot of time in Pakistan and Afghanistan, that indeed was a lot of the lore behind bin Laden was this notion that, hey, there's, here's this, 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 this uh, Robin Hood. You know, here's the greatest escape artist since Houdini, and the West can't get him. That also has led to some conspiracy theories in Pakistan as I travel in and out of there now since, about how he must have been dead already or was never there, because otherwise you know, America would have gotten him years ago. But indeed, much of this lore has now vanished, the brand name lore with his death. And my argument to you is, if we look carefully, and I think we need to look carefully at Zawahiri, how much more that brand name would have tripped if he were dead. And the fifth and final thing, which I want to then touch base off of to go into implications for U.S. policy for Bin Laden's death in Afghanistan and Pakistan, is this notion of Al Qaeda's mystical affiliation with Afghanistan and Pakistan. Indeed, we know they were founded and created there. We know that Al Qaeda was inspired out of the success of the Soviet Jihad. We also know that even though Al Qaeda wandered and drifted away towards Sudan, Somalia, trying to inspire revolution and insurrection in Algeria with no success, trying to put its foot in the water in Bosnia with no success, trying to inspire a revolution in Azerbaijan and the IMU in Uzbekistan in the 90s with no success. They then returned to find that even though they had this little outpost manned by Abu Hafs and some of the other trainers, that you know, bin Laden welcomed back in by the personas not of Osama bin Laden, but of Yunus al Khalis, another uh, Mujahideen figure from uh, Afghanistan, invited back there, were really trying to get up on the horse of success that became the Afghan Taliban. Again, trying to graft and co-op that success as the most critical success, the first emirate, the first proto-caliphate, but to claim it for its own. And here, the schisms and the splits of claiming it for its own, I think we need to go back and revisit now. 
Because the other thing bin Laden did in the late 1990s was he effectively milked relationships that he, I would argue to you, and indeed the evidence in the record kind of suggests he alone had or was capable of having with a number of the key players in the Afghan Taliban revolution. Critical amongst those were the aforementioned Yunus Khalas, uh, who has been a critical figure in eastern Afghanistan. Uh, Jaladin Haqqani, uh, who, who, and with his son, we all know, and, and very few of us knew about a few years ago, run the Haqqani network, uh, as well as uh, you know, Omar himself, albeit much more at distance. And there, I argue in the paper that it's, it's the baya, the swear of allegiance, between bin Laden and uh, Mullah Omar that explains a lot of the Taliban persona and, and unwillingness to really perhaps uh, tear into some of the Arab uh, approaches uh, to fighting globally or to tear into some of the slights felt and perceived by the Taliban, indeed as Anna suggested here, to perhaps stave off due to this, 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 this uh, religious overlay of a baya, a personal baya between Omar and, uh, and uh, bin Laden and the, and the kind of underpinning uh, notion of uh, Pashtun hospitality, Pashtun Wali, that made it impossible for Omar to do uh, what perhaps his advisors were saying he should do, which was to jettison the Al-Qaeda and the Arab figures back at that time. And it's that death that I believe brings to, to if not total closure, 80% closure, these critical elements for how we, we see the global uh, metastatization of Al Qaeda in Afghanistan and Pakistan. First and foremost, with the death of bin Laden, the link to Omar is broken. Second, with the death of bin Laden, the link to Haqqani is broken. It either was partially broken by the death of Yunus Khalas in 2006, but now critically broken with the death of bin Laden. And we should expect to see no analog between Zawahiri and the rest of the Arabs and the Libyans who are still left in Western Pakistan. And as a consequence of that, our paradigm for intervention in Afghanistan and Pakistan, and indeed our paradigm for trying to like drive the Taliban to submission, I would argue needs to be have a step back and a relook. Armed by information, armed by the, the uh, documents that can come forward, step back and have a relook and look more critically at what was there before the birth, right? What was there before the terror training camps outside of Kandahar? What was there before that, we will see, it was a proxy war between Pakistan and India. Okay? Manifest and fought out through indirect funding, first by Pakistan. And indeed, I think the record here and where uh, um, Al Qaeda records will help a lot, but they won't be perfect substitutes ever for Pakistani records, is what the relative ratio was of inspiration to the Taliban between Al Qaeda support and Pakistani state security support. And I think here my argument is. It's, the balance is skewed. This was a Pakistani supported element. <laughs> the Taliban know this, all right? And even though they've relied upon help from Al Qaeda over the last several years, they know which side their bread is buttered on. And the death of bin Laden brings a much more into relief, acute relief, that relationship and that matter. Second, the Northern Alliance folks have long been perceived by the Pakistanis and indeed the disaffected Pashtuns, who we euphemistically lump into the term Taliban, but not all Pashtuns are Taliban, although most, if not all, Taliban are Pashtuns, in the belief that it was the Northern Alliance, Uzbeks, Tajiks, Hazaras, Turkmen's, who benefited by American intervention in 2001. And their puppet creation, Karzai in Kabul, is what needs to be guarded against in the perspective of Pakistani state security. And so it's, it's, it's a greater relief and a more, perf a more uh, uh, nuanced picture of that particular element that matters. And here, I'm going to nest quickly in my third element on a couple of the questions that, that, that Brian laid out here, because I think they are, they are essential, uh, which gets to the fact of what are we doing in Afghanistan right now with our presence militarily, diplomatically, and what are we doing in our relations with the Pakistanis as we appear to have this counterterrorism paradigm of driving Al Qaeda to its knees, an Al Qaeda that by our own government's admission maybe now is a handful of 10 to 20 real important operatives. And I would argue to you in the Pakistan border area, we can talk about this in Q&A, probably amounts to no more than Zawahiri and two or three others that could really lead a credible international organization or even threaten a return of terror camps into Afghanistan. Uh, and then are faced with a question about how much enmity we build up in a, in a region, in an area, where the real question is how to inhibit dramatic proxy war and civil war from erupting in Afghanistan if we precipitously depart without getting the right military and diplomatic sinews in place to mitigate a what, against what is already a in place and long-standing air element there. 
And second, in Pakistan, does our, do our continuing drone strikes drive animosity up so far that we compromise our ability with a country that one is going to be key to negotiating any kind of a localized settlement in Afghanistan, and B is going to be a country we need open lines of communication with because it's the fifth largest nuclear state. Internally, it's not going to collapse tomorrow, but it has its own Islamic radical pro problems that others may outreach to us better in the future on. And C, its nuclear weapons program and its animosity to uh, India indicates it may well look for an opportunity in the not too near future to, uh, to, to generate some type of a clash on the border area that could go nuclear and could stay tactical nuclear given the way the nuclear profile is developing. And so those questions all matter and tie back then to what I think we need to be looking at going forward in the records. First, I think the trove of Al Qaeda cash that's come out of Abbottabad is vitally important to determining more about these five critical elements of Al Qaeda and, and not only how they apply in the Afghan Pakistan region, but how they apply more broadly. First, we should seek out access to find out whether Bin Laden's inspiration and charisma and fundraising ability was as fundamental to Al Qaeda's core as many now believe. Second, we should find out whether his close confidence faces increasingly difficult challenges in absorbing this world uh, of vision. Uh, and I think we see some of that already coming out saying that they were. And but finally, and I think more importantly, it's important for us to look at uh, and understand um, the, the, the nature in which um, the um, fortunes of Al-Qaeda in Western Pakistan have altered due to uh, their perception of Pakistani support or lack of support and in terms of the degree to which the Afghan-Pakistan crisis is really now a lot more about the Indo-Pakistan uh, proxy war in Afghanistan than it is the crisis in and of itself. Let me tag out by just, just offering a point on perspective and why I think the perspective here of what we get from Al-Qaeda needs also to be balanced with the record of what we can find as difficult as it is from governments like the Pakistani government, which, though not supportive of Al-Qaeda, has been supportive of elements that are of the same uh, philosophy, religiously perhaps, as Al-Qaeda. And that is uh, to offer you my anecdote about uh, coming out of Pakistan in late 2009, uh, correction, in late 2011 here, in July 2011. Indeed, I, I flew out of Pakistan in the surreal experience of being on an aircraft with uh, uh, leaving Islamabad, going through Beijing to Tokyo en route back to Washington uh, after just having interviewed a number of folks about radicalism in Pakistan and Afghanistan and, and, and coming to some distinct conclusions there. Being on an aircraft with, with mine being the only Caucasian Western face, uh, finding out that we had aircraft challenges in Beijing and then being laid up overnight in Tokyo and arriving after a, a three-hour bus ride to the hotel for the layover in Tokyo uh, to the television talking about uh, the explosive terrorist act in Norway. And uh, sort of out of a cob fascination and also out of jet lag and frustration of not being able to get home for another 24 hours, I sat there with my watch in hand looking at uh, CNN, Al Jazeera International, BBC, ITV, all the others that the great Japanese networks could provide and watched in, in fascination for an eight hour period where the only talking heads brought on to that constellation of networks continued to spin furiously this notion of how what had happened in Norway could be tied to some comment made by Zawahiri in 2003 or how some fatwa issued in Somalia could have tied to what this individual was, et cetera. And I'm looking at this and having looked at terrorist profiles from 2004, was saying to myself, this is, either this is a brand new prototype of Salafi jihadi or Al Qaeda terrorism, or it's got nothing to do with it. Why are we then spending eight hours, other than the explanation that most of the talking heads are employed to talk about Al Qaeda in the event of anything? Why are we spending all this time doing this? And, 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 and then the come around to that gets back to my point about where we need to go, I think, in the future of looking at Al Qaeda. Without just saying we're going to dump all of our work against Al Qaeda, we need to ask the wider questions. What else is out there? And how have we got so wedded right now to this narrative of Al Qaeda that we could have spent eight hours on the major international news networks? And the Japanese had them all, folks, okay? Even ones I couldn't speak the language of. We're so wedded to this thesis of trying to find and pound a square peg of Al Qaeda nemesis and terror into the round hole of the complexity of a lot of these local engagements that we miss the reality for the mythology. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Lynch. It gave us a lot to think about. I would ask folks not then to look at the uh, commentary I gave on C CBS and BBC <laughs> at that time. <laughs> but, uh, thank you. Thank you. Alexander, why don't you bring us home uh, literally and figuratively? Thank you. Um, I'm afraid I'm, I was also one of those who uh, made the mistake on BBC. Um, Present company, etc. <laughs> um, 
I suppose my paper looks uh, is to two, two, two uh, splits up in two parts, really. Um, uh, first, I'm going to look at the uh, sort of history and development of the uh, Al Qaeda media strategy as it relates uh, particularly or specifically uh, to the homegrown uh, jihadi issue and, and how that might look in the future. And also, um, second part of that, we'll look at uh, sort of what aspects of the Salafi jihadi ideology uh, appear to be most appealing to Muslims living in the West who have been mobilized. Um, so beginning with the first part, uh, so in the ten, so as we know already, in the 10 years since 9-11, um, Al-Qaeda and its affiliates and sympathizers have developed a very sophisticated uh, online media network which disseminates sort of the ideological, strategic, and tactical uh, works of the movement far and wide, uh, making them accessible to anyone with an internet connection. Uh, in addition to these widely available documents, uh, many of which have been either written in or translated into English now, a number of influential ideologues appear to have tossed themselves over the, over, over the years since 9-11, as it were, selling the movement to a Western audience. Uh, we know of Abu Hamza al-Masri, the well-known hook-handed cleric of North London, uh, who is still fighting extradition to the U.S., I think, on human rights grounds, I believe. Um, uh, and then, of course, up to now, Anwar al -Awlaki. Um, these ideologues have, through their lectures and sermons, I believe, successfully translated ideas that were originally meant for South Asian and, and Arab audiences um, so that they now may appeal to Western uh, Muslims, um, as well as providing Western audiences with the ideological backbone of the, of the movement. Uh, global jihadists have also created a body of work which outlines their strategy uh, for recruitment and mobilization uh, far and wide. Uh, so I will look first at the sort of history of that, and I, the CRC. Uh, provides us with a very useful document, uh, which I believe, uh, though I could stand corrected, um, is the first real attempt to think of a, a media strategy for the jihadis, uh, which was written by Abu Hafs al-Masri, uh, who's been mentioned many times on all the panels, I believe, uh, in the spring of 1990 in Peshawar, Pakistan, uh, entitled uh, On the Jihadi Media, How to Communicate to the Public. Uh, this 17-page document lays out a vision for the future of al-Qaeda's messaging efforts, in particular as they relate to spreading their ideology and appealing to a wider audience. Uh, despite his involvement in the early years of Al-Qaeda, uh, Abu Hafs was beginning to think beyond, already beyond the constraints of a formal and tightly knit organization. Instead, he saw the entire Ummah, uh, the Islamic nation as they see it, as a recruitment ground and sought to formulate a strategy which would reach out uh, to mu as much of that as possible. Uh, portraying the Jihad as a movement, uh, the essay begins with Abu Hafs's view on the importance of jihadi media as a way to communicate with and mobilize followers and potential recruits. He writes, the jihad media is an important communication mean between the jihad movement and the Muslim population. It is a part of the political effort of the movement and a tool to mobilize the population. Uh, he understood that in order to achieve a significant level of mobilization uh, in favor of the jihad movement, jihadi media had to play a leading role uh, in elucidating for Muslims, as he puts it, uh, the reasons of this war between the Mujahideen and the idol, as, as uh, the idol authorities obviously, uh, him uh, was much more focused on the, uh, the Arab tyrannies at that point. He was not really thinking too much about the far enemy. Um, so, as to, uh, so the reasons for this war between the Mujahideen and the idol, as well as the goal of this war, it was, this, was the, this is what the, the media should be able to uh, explain to people. Um, and even at this early stage in Al-Qaeda's development, uh, Abu Hafs had recognized that if the jihadi movement was to win its war against secularism and unbelief, uh, success on the battlefield would only be part of the equation. Of equal, uh, if not larger significance, was what we, we commonly refer to as the battle of ideas. Um, as he puts again in the document, uh, the essence of the conflict between the Mujahideen and the idol authority is a conflict between atheism and unbelief. And the spirit and mind of the people is the real space of this conflict. So in addition, uh, it was the role of jihadi media to influence, uh, as he puts it again, the Muslim population on the moral, psychological, and intellectual level, convincing it of the necessity to oust the idol regime and giving the practical example of the possibility to do so. Um, and in social scientific terms, essentially what Abu Hafs wanted media to do was to offer followers and potential recruits um, a diagnosis of, of the problems that they face, as well as the prognosis or as a, a sort of uh, what, what the acceptable response should be, and the motivations to act. And he wanted the media, the media to really offer all of these. <coughs> um, thus, the jihadi movement had to create, as, as he thought, uh, cadres of devoted media specialists, uh, wholly separate in terms of personnel from the military leadership, while also working in tandem with military operations uh, so as to achieve maximum uh, propaganda impact. Uh, he also placed a high premium on this relationship, uh, 
claiming that the, again quoting him, the success of the enemy in paralyzing the media action of the Mujahideen is as significant as the capability of the enemy to paralyze the military action itself. Western media was not to be trusted as far as he was concerned. It's not only did Haft deem it to be working with Western governments in order to destroy Islam, but also deliberately providing false information about the Mujahideen, their tactics and goals. Thus, Haft recognized the importance of creating an alternative uh, media source to the mainstream media. And this is actually a very important aspect of any successful social movement, is the creation of their own media source that will connect them with potential recruits as well as current followers and strengthen those relationships. Um, he also lists in the strategy document what he believes to be the best means of communication. Um, and of course, if this was written, of course, before the internet was one of the world's primary modes of communication. So he restricted his, his resources really to technologies like audio and video cassettes, uh, radio and television. Um, he also envisaged it at, at the time when jihadi groups would have their own radio stations. And as we know, we've gone far beyond that now. Um, moving on uh, to see how this has developed a bit more. Um, so we're 21 years on now, his vision, I believe, endures in some way, though it's been transformed somewhat. And I think it was updated and refined by uh, the arch al-Qaeda strategist Abu Musab al-Suri, who's again been mentioned quite a few times by many of the panelists, um, in his 2004 treatise, The Call of the Global Islamic Resistance. Uh, in this, uh, Suri wrote in great detail about the importance of uh, jihadi media, uh, while also looking uh, beyond the constraints of formal group organization, echoing much of what Abu Hafs had observed over a decade earlier. In fact, uh, in his 1,600-page uh, uh, document, Al-Suri devotes a paragraph of his, of his work to praise Abu Hafs, uh, along, strangely, with Osama bin Laden, uh, because actually he, he wasn't very happy with bin Laden becoming the face of this movement. But uh, he was, he was uh, in praise of Abu Hafs' strategic vision, uh, writing, uh, and I quote, uh, these two, uh, bin Laden and Abu Hafs, believe that the time of local and regional organizations had passed and would be inappropriate for the coming stage. They believed that the duty was to mobilize the Ummah toward confrontation with the external enemy as represented by America. Uh, so the struggle against the West was to be executed, according to Suri, on a global scale. Uh, and the uh, jihad movement required a detailed strategy uh, to address this. Like Abu Hafsi sought to include the entire Ummah uh, in this fight. Um, and I quote him, uh, quote Al Suri again here, uh, I am convinced that victory is in the hands of God. And the primary prerequisites for this are working to transform this confrontation into an ummah-wide battle after the ummah has been ignited by the jihadist elite. Uh, so while he maintained that the global jihad had to, had to keep an intellectual and operational elite uh, that still had a sort of coherent strategy, it could be done without a, entirely relying on a formal organization. Uh, instead, his work uh, called for something of a restructuring of global jihadism. Uh, Suri, having observed that the post-9-11 world was distinctly uncharitable uh, towards organized and hierarchical jihadi groups, wanted to transform al-Qaeda into a diffuse international movement connected mainly through Islamic solidarity and ideology that transcended culture, transcended nationality, and, and everything else. Thus, again, he writes in his treatise, uh, the call for the global Islamic resistance is not a political party or an organization or a specific limited group. It is an open call. And of course, uh, the definitive work on Al Suri, for anyone who, who doesn't know, uh, is by Brin Yarlia, Architect of Global Jihad. Um, that's all you really need to read to know, to know about Al Suri. Um, accordingly, uh, he now recommended that Al Qaeda increase its efforts to project its ideas and solutions around the globe. By encouraging this new uh, decentralized version of Al Qaeda, uh, Suri sought to spark the creation of numerous self starter uh, individuals and terrorist cells with little to no organizational connections to the group. This school of individual jihad, as he <coughs> refers to it, uh, was free from the constraints of conventional warfare, could effectively subvert the military superiority of the West on the battlefield while also avoiding the dangers of recruits being arrested while traveling to the epicenters of jihad in Afghanistan, Iraq, and elsewhere. Uh, unlike his uh, predecessor, Abu Hafs, al Sri was operating in the internet age, which had opened up avenues far beyond what the Egyptian commander uh, could ever have imagined. Uh, referring to what he defined as the informational resistance. Al-Suri wrote that this element of the conflict must be conducted through the use of modern technology of all forms, especially in satellite and the internet, to promote the resistance and entice people to action. Indeed, um, it's no coincidence uh, that uh, his treaties first appeared on, on online jihadist forums, and he was among, among the first of the global jihadis other than, other than bin Laden to make, to make effective use of the internet. Uh, in addition to updating the means of the movement's messaging and media, Suri also envisaged uh, an expansion in its scope. 
Uh, the jihadist uh, resistance, as he puts it, against idol worship and Western aggression could be implemented by small groups of individuals anywhere in the world, and jihadi internet media was to be the cornerstone of uh, this approach. Uh, and he writes, uh, the global jihad considers the battlefield of every mujahid and combatant to be where the mujahid lives, where he moves, where his performance is more productive and more beneficial and worse for the enemies of God. Uh, this also, of course, then applied to Muslims living in the West, to which al Suri provided two options. Uh, migrate to Muslim-majority countries, make the hijra like Muhammad did uh, from Mecca to Medina, um, or carry out attacks within their host nations. Suri's preferred option, interesting, was actually the former. Um, he wanted to see more hijra. He wanted to see them going to the battlefields and, and fighting and helping how they could there. Um, and also, so that, we may, so, that may be to, so that they may actually uh, practice their religion properly, as, as, as you can't technically do that as far as Salafi jihadis are concerned in a secular democracy. Um, <clears throat> however, for those who uh, did choose to remain in the West, they had to fulfill their uh, Islamic obligations as far as he was concerned to fight jihad and target military, political, economic institutions. Indeed, uh, these Muslims were identified by al Suri as having an obvious and distinct advantage over the other potential mujahideen and that they were best placed to facilitate attacks within, within their host nation. Uh, he wrote that the call for resistance reminds every Muslim living in the West, even those who are authentic Western citizens, that the obligation of jihad against these infidel governments who are in alliance with America and Israel is a specific obligation upon them, similar to any other Muslim anywhere. His compliance is easier than that of the mujahideen who do not live there and who visit such a country to deter its governments from attacking Muslims. Um, building on Abu Hafs's idea of small specialist jihadi media cadres, uh, Al Suri called for the creation of, and I quote again, clandestine incitement brigades made up of uh, one to three members who were well versed in the Sharia, politics, and letters, and possess media expertise, knowledge of activism, and expertise in using the internet and electronic communications networks. Uh, one of the main utilities of such a group or individual would be to help ferment the individual jihad by providing jihadi media consumers with the requisite ideological, strategic, and operational materials required to carry the tax within their host nations. Uh, working tirelessly to prove that the West is at war with Islam and Muslims, this would also provide all of the theological justifications for a violent global response, along with the bomb manuals and other uh, information about weaponry. Um, in addition, each group would tailor its material based on the region it was targeting for recruitment. Uh, and for Suri's strategy to work in the West, it really required an effective interpreter. Um, and I argue that perhaps uh, whether he intentionally wanted to or not, Allah he may represent that, that required interpreter for, for Western mobilization. Um, so I'll briefly look at a selection of his work, uh, Allah's work, uh, aimed at mobilizing Western Muslims and offer a couple of case studies of individuals radicalized, in part at least, by the uh, ideologue's output. Uh, the question in many cases is not whether al laki has successfully conveyed both the supposed reality of the war in Islam uh, and, the, and the religious imperative to react with violence, but rather how he's achieved this. And along with uh, US-born Samir Khan, uh, he has overseen the creation of uh, and publication of what we, uh, we discussed before, Inspire Magazine. Um, its, its effect and its importance is debatable, of course, but it's not a coincidence that Inspire uh, regularly reprints passages from al Suri's work, particularly those which relate to the school of individual jihad. Um, and of course, in, in, in one of al uh seminal works, 44 Ways to Support Jihad, uh, he continues in a similar vein to Abu Hafs and al Suri uh, when he stresses the importance of jihadi media in offering an alternative to the mainstream Western media, <coughs> and as he puts it, spreading the writings of the mujahideen and their scholars. Although not a pure strategist in the mold of al Suri and Abu Hafs, uh, he, al Aki is perhaps the embodiment of uh, the type of Islamic preaching ideologue that they had envisioned. Uh, using jihadi media to effectively spread the Salafi jihadi ideology, as well as offering convincing explanations of the problems faced by the Ummah and the correct solutions or responses. Uh, now, one of the most important things that you have to do if you're going to try and mobilize a Western Muslim is to convince them really that this supposed war on Islam is, is real. Um, and it's happening, it's happening on their doorstep. It's not just happening miles away in Afghanistan and Iraq, um, being beamed by the, by the news corporations. It's happening on, right next door, right in their own cities, right in their own countries. And you have to figure out ways to frame certain events in order to convince them. Um, one of them, uh, so I'm not, I'm not going to look at al stuff about Afghanistan and Iraq. I'll look at how, what other ways he, he tries to sort of uh, make this war on Islam a reality for his audience. Um, 
in a, in a, in a 2008 talk he gave um, called The Battle of Hearts and Minds, again, appropriating Western political discourse and talk um, for his own means. Uh, hearts and Minds becoming a very famous term post-Iraq. Um, he gave an online lecture where he referred to two reports by the Rand Corporation uh, entitled uh, Building Moderate Muslim Networks in Civil Democratic Islam, in which the authors, uh, Ankel Rabasa and uh, Cheryl Bernard, respectively, offer a number of basic criteria for what they consider to be a moderate, uh, is, uh, to be a moderate Islam, as well as uh, recommendations for how to empower it. Uh, their criteria included uh, belief in democracy, uh, acceptance of non-sectarian law, respect for the rights of women and religious minorities, and the opposition to terrorism and illegitimate violence. Alaki's response to these four criteria uh, were, were, was the following. So from what you see, a moderate Muslim to them is in reality a non-Muslim, because according to these four definitions, the definitions that they gave, this is, this is kufr, this is not Islam. So from, what, from, from now on, I'm not going to call it a moderate Muslim, but I think a more appropriate term would be Rand Muslim. And this is a term he coined, Rand Muslim or Rand Islam. Uh, the US is trying to change Islam itself, he says. Without any shame, they're openly stating that we have a desire not only to influence the Muslim societies, but we want to change the religion itself. So really what we're talking about here is that these efforts, according to al are just yet another facet of this war on Islam, which amount to, to nothing more than attempts by the Crusader West uh, to alter the true meaning of the religion and prevent it from spreading or gaining power. Um, another real hot point for a lot of Muslims in the West, and, and of course, not, not just Western Muslims, but particularly uh, f for those in the West, is, is the Muhammad cartoons uh, fiasco or controversy, whatever you, you'd like to call it. Um, Again, in May 2008, just after his release from, from prison, uh, he gave a sermon on, on Pal Talk, a, quite a well-known uh, chat forum for uh, jihadi Salafis, at least in Salafi jihadis. Uh, it was entitled, The Dust Will Never Settle Down. Uh, it addressed the ongoing Muhammad cartoons controversy in Europe and the US, and in particular, the cartoons drawn in Sweden. The depictions of Muhammad are framed as yet another aspect of the war on Islam, which involved defaming and ridiculing Muslims. The publicity for the sermon, which appeared on a number of popular Islamic forums, promised that Allahi would give listeners the required information on, and I quote, what is the ruling of Sharia on such incidents insulting the Prophet, and how did the Sahaba deal with such people, and who and what do our scholars say about them? Uh, the talk focused on figures from Islamic history who had shown great devotion to the Prophet, and Allahi held them up as examples uh, for Western Muslims to follow. Uh, this usual juxtaposition of, of, of the early years of Islam onto the modern uh, uh, current political climate of being a real trademark of his work. Um, referring to the original fiasco triggered by the Danish cartoons, he proudly stated that the Muslim world was on fire, yet the reaction to the subsequent Swedish cartoons was unacceptably sanguine or lethargic <laughs> because, our, because, as he puts it again, our enemies have successfully